And good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. So we're really excited to bring you a great conversation today. Today's conversation focuses on California, but the lessons and insights apply to anywhere you're dialing in from, where, you're, where you are working toward an excellent and equitable ed education for all children. This is a story about a lawsuit on behalf of low-income students and students of color who do not receive an equal education that their state constitution promised them during the period of remote learning early on in the pandemic. It's a story of a $2 billion settlement for that lawsuit, one of the largest education-related settlements in US history. But it's a story about much more than the big price tag. It's a story about educational justice and not accepting the status quo of what we are given. It's a story about courage, perseverance, partnership, solutions, accountability, and transparency. It's a story that we are excited to share with you, thanks to our wonderful guests who are with us today to tell it. Today, you will hear from an attorney who worked on the lawsuit and settlement, a nonprofit leader who works with families to create solutions to tackle educational inequity, the executive director of a university center who served as an expert witness in the lawsuit, a superintendent who, through his 13-year tenure, has made significant progress in his district to create equitable learning opportunities for all students, and a policy expert who will speak to state and local policy impl implications of this lawsuit and settlement. And with that, it's my honor to introduce today's guests. And first, we have uh, Dr. Joseph Bishop, PhD, co-founder and executive director for the UCLA Center for the Transformation of Schools. And before co-founding the center, Dr. Bishop held a number of state and national educational leadership positions and is the author of Our Children Can't Wait, The Urgency of Reinventing Education Policy in America from Teachers College Press and host of a podcast of the same name. So make sure to check it out. Next, we have Dr. Darren Brawley, EDD, Superintendent of Compton Unified Public Schools in California. Now in his 13th year, yes, you heard that right, 13th year as Superintendent of Compton Unified, under Dr. Brawley's leadership, Compton schools have been awarded national blue ribbon status and several schools have received Title I performing schools recognition, as well as California Dis Distinguished School Awards. Dr. Brawley has served in various roles in education over the years, from high school teacher to principal to several district roles before assuming superintendency. Next, we have Amanda Mangasser Savage, JD, Sullivan and Cromwell Strategic Litigation Council with Public Council. At Public Council, Amanda works with movement organizers and community groups to build cases that push the law toward racial equity. She worked on the case we are discussing today and other pivotal cases and received her BA from Harvard University and her JD from Yale Law School. Next, we have Natalie Wheatfall Lum, JD, Director of TK through 12 Policy with the Education Trust West. Natalie oversees EdTrust West TK through 12 Policy Analysis, Position Development and Advocacy Strategy with a laser focus on racial equity. Before working in education policy, Natalie practiced law, gaining experience in various civil rights issues, including LGBTQ equal rights, fair housing, and immigration. And last but certainly not least, we have Lakeisha Young, founder and CEO with the Oakland Reach. Lakeisha developed a formula that has guided Reach's work since day one. Ask families questions, listen to their aspirations, build the solutions, liberate our communities. This formula has produced a mix of groundbreaking programming and advocacy work over the last six years, including the virtual family hub and the lib liberator model, which Lakeisha will share about later. Lakeisha is a respected national voice on parent power and regularly consults other cities across the country interested in learning more about REACH's trans transformative model. And all of these discussions will be moderated by our fabulous GLR executive Fe fellow, John Gompertz. So if you've been with us before, you know we're in for a super engaging session. John was previously the president and CEO of America's Promise Alliance. And prior to that, John served as the director of AmeriCorps in the Obama administration and had a long career with nonprofits and government organizations devoted to civic engagement. So turn it over to you, John. Thanks so much, Mary. And thanks to the whole team for putting together today's session. Uh, I am really, really psyched about this. So uh, this is the third webinar that I have hosted this month, which I don't know, we can check with Sarah, but I think that's a record. And it's also my birthday. So I'm gonna take a point of personal privilege here and say that this, um, this subject today is very close to my 
part in my own history. About a hundred years ago, actually 53 years ago, um, my family was the lead plaintiff in an education lawsuit in California, of all things. Um, I kid you not, we were the lead plaintiffs in a lawsuit that um, sought to require the Sequoia Union High School District to, to desegregate the seven high schools in our district. Spoiler alert, we lost. We did not get a $2 billion settlement and we did not get desegregation in our school district. Um, but for me, that, that experience is a touchstone for uh, a touchstone for our subject today. So I uh, suspect that everybody who's joining us today has pretty much gotten the memo and the message that the campaign for grade level reading is tightly focused on gaps in educational progress and growth. I think this week you should have gotten an email about GLR week 2024. That's July 22nd to July 26th. Mark your calendars now. Um, you will see that that is the theme of GLR week this year. Um, and this will be a theme for us throughout the year. The plain fact is that the gaps are too big and they've persisted too long. It's, it's unconscionable, it's wrong. Um, and it's time to end this idiocy and this injustice. And that is actually exactly what our friends in California did. They knew the historical disparities and we'll hear some about that. They saw what was happening during the pandemic was, which was making those disparities worse, much worse. And they said, no, no, this is not okay. They said enough. And they said all of that in the form of a lawsuit against the state. And as Mary uh, said, that lawsuit recently settled for at least $2 billion, which is a lot better than my family did in our lawsuit. It's a remarkable story. Um, there are some parts that are California specific, but there are large parts of this story and this discussion that can provide inspiration, information, and ideas for action for folks around the country. So let's get right on into it. And let me start with Amanda, who was one of the attorneys with public counsel. And Amanda, it would be really helpful for us, I think, if you were just to start with um, why your firm, what your firm saw and what made your firm think, oh, what we see is the ground for a lawsuit. Yes, thank you, John. Um, and thank you, Mary and the Campaign for Grade Level Reading for, for having us to, to talk about this lawsuit today. Um, I think I would just start out by saying that it wasn't just public counsel. Um, and this was really a community driven lawsuit. And so, you know, we have Lakeisha here today from the Oakland Reach. We are in very close partnership with another group that was originally an organizational plaintiff in the lawsuit community Co coalition based out of South LA. And what they said to us, you know, was this, um, we're basically in a system where, um, you know, hearkening back to the middle of the 20th century, kids are basically being shut out of schools and it's on a racialized basis and it's on a wealth basis. We are seeing segregation um, in the form of lack of access to remote learning. And you know, none of this was surprising to those of us, right? We're living through the pandemic, especially those of us with children. Every other day you'd see something about, you know, kids in wealthier districts are forming their own pods and you know the gaps are the gaps are widening and i think that one of the things that we have always cared about is the fact that these you know these gaps didn't come out during the pandemic but like so many other things they were just blown open by it um and in california we have a robust um 
educational rights jurisprudence. And it seemed to us quite obvious, right? In the same way that segregation is obviously wrong. The fact that kids were being excluded literally from school, like from the remote classroom, yeah. um, was a violation of their educational rights. And that's how we came to be involved, um, along with Morrison and Forster, our pro bono partner. Gotcha. Um, do you think that this case was winnable, actually? It is certainly, I think it was a novel <clears throat> case um, under the circumstances, because of course, you know, this was our first time living through a global pandemic. Right. Um, it, was not, <laughs> it was not novel in the claims, right, that we brought. And, and that's why I think, you know, we can talk about this later, but the claims are not difficult to understand, right? There was a racial discrimination claim, there was a wealth discrimination claim, and there was a claim that basically there was not what's called basic educational equity in California schools. And, you know, kids were receiving meaningfully different educations by virtue of their zip code, by virtue of their race, and by virtue of their, you know, parental income. And I think we all know, and we've long known, that that is not the way that educational opportunity should be allocated, even though it all too often is. Um, so I would say novel circumstances, not novel claims, but novel claims in these circumstances. Okay, fair, 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 fair. Um, Lakeisha, can you join us for a second? I know we're already going out of order, but I, I, I want I want to bring you in right away. Um, you all represent the the parents who who um, were the moving parties in this lawsuit, and I, I would love it. I think it would be helpful right now for you to say a little bit of what you were observing going on in <laughs> Oakland that gave rise to thinking, okay, we're ready to do this. Um, we're gonna come back to what Oakland Reach is and some of the fantastic things you're doing in a second. But here, let's stick with this story of the lawsuit for a sec, okay? Sure, well, public counsel, if I remember, cause it's been four years, I think they came to us, right? So I think the question is, is why would they come to this organization, yeah. 78 square miles in Oakland, right? Yeah. Um, and they came to us because we had already acknowledged and began addressing what we were seeing happening um, with the pandemic. So right before schools had shut down, we had just had a big policy win um, around literacy, which was pushing the district to move to the science of reading. And we did that in coalition. And literally a month later, all schools shut down. When the schools shut down, we um, started a fund that got almost half a million dollars to families, like a thousand families across Oakland, because a lot of our families were frontline workers. But then we started asking ourselves the question, what could, how could we take this crisis and turn it into an opportunity to do better for our kids than the system is doing for them now? That was yeah. the question in front yeah. of reach in March. And yeah. that led us to building the virtual hub. I won't go into the virtual hub. We'll but come it back to that. Right. And maybe not because it's passed. I think the important thing to know about the virtual hub is that that is what um, it was the right solution at the right time to give our families the sense of like, we don't have to fail in this moment. We actually can thrive in this moment. And we got a lot of success with that, which got us a lot of media attention, which put us on the radar of public counsel. So I would say that the theme there and I'll end is that we were already addressing educational inequities um, prior to the pandemic, then we decided to build a new innovative solution to do that, to meet the moment. And then that is what connected us and put us on this four year journey with public counsel. Fantastic. Um, I just, I've read a bunch of the stories about this lawsuit, of course, preparing to talk with all of you today. Um, I think it would be useful, Lakeisha, if you gave folks who are listening a little flavor of just how extreme what was going on in California was, just how little education um, kids were getting, um, particularly kids in um, less advantaged districts. Yeah, I mean, I think what we saw immediately when school shut down is that connection, right? Between yeah. Connection between families and schools got we're disconnected as well. Yeah. I mean, you would be surprised at how many schools do not have the phone numbers 
and information of our families, right? Yeah. And then our districts and unions have to go into a negotiation around how is learning in this way going to happen. That took a few weeks, right? Yeah. So you're already dealing with high chronic absenteeism, low reading and math scores, yeah. and now you have to set the new rules of engagement around that. So I would say that when you ask this question about how bad it was, it was already bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't I don't need to like pile more doo doo on that. What I will say to you, though, is that when the pandemic hit, everything stopped. Right. And we got into sort of um, surviving mode and negotiating mode. Yeah. And that only that that impacted everyone, by the way. So I want to name that. Right. I think everybody yeah. was struggling. But for kids who were struggling with reading and math, you just see their education just stop whatever education they were getting and how rigorous or not it was, it just stopped full stop yeah. for a long time. And right. that's where we were in March of 2020. Gotcha. Um, Amanda, back to you. What kind of, but stick with us here, Lakeisha. You don't, don't turn off your screen. Um, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here all day. <laughs> uh, Amanda, <laughs> tell us a little bit about um, what you did in terms of gathering evidence to support this lawsuit. And then um, when you're done, I'm gonna ask Joe to come in and because Joe presented some of that evidence um, and just to, to tell the story, I, I just wanna make it um, really vivid for folks, like just how extreme this situation was that gave rise to you thinking a lawsuit was a good idea, parents being willing to engage on that front. So let's let's make that picture clear and tell us a little bit about what you did to gather evidence to support this uh, this legal action. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was through, you know, partnerships with Oakland Reach and, and also partnerships sort of locally with public council, public councils based out of L.A. Um, with Community Coalition, whom I mentioned, yeah. where we really just learned about what was happening on a day to day basis in students homes. Right. And, you know, students having to try to access their classes on a single iPhone, even in a family with multiple children, right? Students having to um, go to odd places in their house to take classes, right? To, to bathrooms, et cetera, um, because they didn't have strong enough signal. Students just not having devices at all to access the classroom or not having classes taking place, um, as Lakeisha has already touched on. And so, I mean, the stories were not difficult to find because this was like the lived experience of black and brown kids um, and kids in low income districts, kids in rural districts in California. Um, but I think that one thing that is unique about this case is in addition to our partnership with the Oakland Reach and with Community Coalition, um, we enlisted experts like Dr. Bishop, like Dr. Tyrone Howard, um, like Dr. Tom D at Stanford, Dr. Elizabeth Moji, um, all of whom uh, helped us synthesize, right, and um, put into a form, you know, that's just slightly different, right, that, that that maybe in some ways was more palatable, or not even palatable, but more understandable to a court, right, who's used to reading declarations from experts, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that we would all acknowledge here that the real experts are, are Lakeisha, are um, Oria from Community Coalition, are, are the people that were, were doing the work. And so I think we had experts all around in this case. And I think that it was very unique to have um, both the insights from their experiences from the families that they work with, but also the um, kind of overarching analyses that we got from um, our experts. And I forgot uh, one of our experts, Dr. Andrew Ho at Harvard, who was also um, immensely um, helpful to us as we as we built this case. Well, I think what you say there, Amanda, is really important. Um, I think sometimes people think that, I used to be a lawyer a hundred years ago also. Um, people think that it's it's a bunch of technical stuff it's a story, it's a narrative. And you you pulled from, from experts and from families and from community organizations to paint a picture of, of a level of injustice and a level of ignoring a situation that was just, was un, as I said before, unconscionable. And that's, that's, um, that's what makes a case compelling, not, not uh, necessarily the details. Um, Joe, can I ask you to join us? Um, I, I think it would be useful in building our narrative here in this uh, in this session for you to um, share a little bit about uh, the background 
of this lawsuit and what the what the circumstances were. Um, I know you lead a center at, at UCLA um, and you were an expert here. I, I'm curious what kind of information research you put together to make the case for this um, for this lawsuit. And I know uh, Sierra, here we go. We're going to have uh, some slides that help bring this all to life. Not of me. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining. Hi, John. John, good afternoon and um, happy birthday to you. And thank you to Mary <laughs> um, for organizing this really important conversation. So as a as a dad of three boys, uh, an educator, a researcher, when public counsel and Morrison and Forrester reached out, John, and said, Joe, would you be willing to be an expert on this case? Um, I was completely stressed out and overwhelmed trying to figure out how to educate our kids at, from home. <laughs> uh, but I will say that I felt like I, I compelled to do this. Um, and when organizations like Community Coalition and Oakland Reach are involved, um, it's like, okay, add, add this to the plate because this is a historic moment for our country and for our young people. So it's time to step up. So what I'm going to share from you really quick is I would say that the big takeaway, John, the thesis statement is I thought I understood the situation, but I had no idea the levels of the challenges the young people were experiencing and educators. And I just want to share that this is from the perspective of practitioners statewide. Um, we didn't frankly have time to interview students and survey students and parents and caretakers. So, uh, but what, what we learned, I think was very revealing and humbling and deeply concerning for the campaign for grade level, grade level reading. This is a prime moment for you as an organization to step up and step in to help the state determine, to make sure that to use these funds, these $2 billion in the way that they were intended to be used. Yep. Right. Um, lawsuits are, are happen every day, unfortunately. But at the same time, unless folks follow the, follow the money, let the legislature know that you're that you want the campaign for grade level readings priorities are on language and literacy. The money will go in a place where, where we don't know where it's going to go. So the work has, has frankly just begun. And that's why I'm so, um, so appreciative that, that you're hosting this conversation. So I'm going to give you eight findings in three minutes from when the lights. You can have four. You can have four. You can four have minutes. Four. Thank you, John. It's your birthday. You're feeling generous. I appreciate that. Um, when the lights are turned on, documenting the impact of COVID on California's education landscape, uh, Dr. Tyrone Howard and I you know, interviewed folks statewide, um, and here, here's our here's our findings. Next slide, please. Thank you, Sierra. I'm not even gonna get. I'm gonna get into a little bit of this very briefly, but we know that 1.8 million students, according to the Alliance, um, were lacking digital access. We know that 800,000 students didn't have a device or connectivity at one point during the 1920 or 2021 school year. So I just want to set that up. These are two school years that were the focus of this lawsuit. Okay. Next slide, please. Thanks, Sierra. Okay. Finding one, this is not shocking, but in equity, and the focus was, was on remote learning again for those two years. Inequities in remote learning um, were widespread. And there's a quotation from a district leader and the campaign's going to give you these slides when we're done. Next slide, please. Remediation of student learning and socialization um, were universal challenges. Um, what we heard from administrators, school counselors, school psychologists, uh, classroom teachers was it was almost like young people were stuck in time. Um, you had high schoolers who were playing tag. You had middle schoolers who were, um, you know, behind multiple grade levels. Not because they didn't, not because they wanted to be, but they were in a really difficult situation. Uh, finding uh, three, please. Let's go to the next slide, Sierra. Thank you. Um, this is about pre-existing inequities and inequities were accelerated because of the, because of COVID. And because of, frankly, a lack of, of state state response, um, students of color and low income students, we know for decades in the state of California and across the country, have not been um, served well by school systems, and this ramped up that that reality in many instances, especially when we looked at achievement patterns. Next slide, please. Thanks, Sierra. Social, emotional, mental health needs are far exceeding capacity, and this is not an issue that, that's gone away by any means since the lawsuit has been settled. Next slide, please. Okay, now this 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 is the issue of who who's in charge, who's responsible. Little state guidance, guidance or support was being provided to schools to deal with an unprecedented crisis. So to use the analogy, it was like schools were undertaking and communities were undertaking her Herculean efforts to, to educate young people without a control tower. 
right? They were flying without a control tower and, and, and trying to figure it on their own. Next slide, please. Basic needs are more fundamental than ever to student learning. We talk, we can talk about language and literacy, but young people don't have um, a place to call home, don't have food, clothing, families don't have jobs. Uh, if there's no connectivity, um, which is a basic need now, um, we, you know, that that's a starting point before we jump into these these bigger issues around standards based instruction. Next slide, please. We have a weak pipeline of educators and staff, um, which was making it incredibly difficult to find subs. You, you had uh, principals covering multiple classrooms, teachers covering multiple classrooms. Everybody was in survival mode. It was incredibly difficult. And many of those realities have not changed much, unfortunately. Finding eight. I'm almost there, John. Getting there. No, you're doing great. This is fascinating. It's fantastic. Go. Yeah. Um, what, what we heard over and over again was that one time money wasn't going to be enough. And we needed uh, an aggressive state response um, to support racial justice and equity. And these one one time funds for community schools, expanded learning, mental health, unless there was a focus on race or a very targeted response, um, we're not we're not going to move far. And that's what we heard over and over again from practitioners. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to actually go jump to the recommendations and put in a plug for for two last pieces for everybody to look at. We know that uh, we've we've ended up in this space because we've seen these issues as strictly education issues. We've ignored structural racism. We've ignored schools in ignored factors in school and out of school, which are which are um, creating this, this cumulative disadvantage for young people and families across our country. So in that same vein, we need to think about a core body of state agencies, the state board, the administration or governor um, and legislative members to work together and all hands on deck approach. We need better data. We're data rich, implementation poor in California. I know I've worked in other states. That's not uncommon. I know John's been doing a lot of this work his whole career. Um, we need a roadmap and a clear plan for boosting enrollment. Tom D at Stanford was one of our partners in this work. He found that enrollment declined by 26%. When you have declining enrollment combined with decreased attendance and decreased funding, it's a perfect storm of setting up public education um, to not serve young people well. We need better capacity um, that acknowledge race and culture and language. And last but not least, we've learned that more and more, not only do we need better data, we need data collected in a more centralized fashion, real-time data. We, we get data from the year prior to, teachers get it from, from the previous cohort, previous, previous group of students, and then are expected to um, support instructional change in learning um, with, with outdated information. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there, Sierra right. and John, and actually I'm, I'm going to give you one, one last plug, one last plug for you to consider. Next slide, please, Sierra. Thank you so much. There's another report that Lucrecia Santibanez, who runs the center with myself and Tyrone wrote around social, emotional, mental health and well-being. Um, there's a lot in her report. You can find it on our website. Um, but what, what concerns me is that as experts, we were asked, you know, you, you, you shouldn't, the, the work the work that we were doing as scholars is work the state of California should should have been doing. The fact that I know folks from Oakland Reach and Community Coalition were questioned over and over again, is this really an issue or why why couldn't parents just just provide provide a device or I mean there there was this passing the buck mentality or blaming folks or pointing the finger at the wrong folks, which I think for me as a as an expert on this case was deeply concerning, but I just want to end by saying again, the campaign for grade level reading, like this is your time with that $2 billion to do work in California and other states like you've done historically. So make the most of the moment, let folks know you know about this case, use our findings as ammunition and uh, evidence-based research to inform the path forward if you can. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks, Joe. Don't go far. Don't go far. Um, that was so useful in sort of setting up what, what this um, is all about. Lakeisha, I just wanna, I wanna come back to you for a second and then come back to Amanda. Um, what Joe laid out, um, that, that rings true for you? That, that reflect the, uh, the experience in Oakland? I mean, I don't really, I got some <laughs> of it. I mean, it's uh, four minutes. <laughs> Can you give okay. me a more specific question? No, no, no. I'm just, I, I, I'm just trying to get a, you know, these, these are experts who came or came around and made a series of observations about what was going on, and you know, I just want to. You all signed up for this lawsuit. 
Uh, yeah, so let me let me make a, a correction here. And I think Amanda good. started there. We are the experts. Fair. So I respect everything Joseph does, but we are the experts, Fair. right? Okay. Oakland good. Reach had already created something, was building it and getting results before the lawsuit came to us. So I know like part of you mentioned like experts and families, but families are the experts. And then when families create solutions to address their own problems, then you have something on a whole nother level. And that's why we've been able to maintain a really strong relationship with public counsel for four years. It's almost somewhat less about a lawsuit, but more because they valued us as experts um, for what we could do around building solutions and addressing what's in our community. So I would say that part and parcel of what Joe has shared, yes, I would you know, say, yes, this happened, right? Yep, yep. But by the time this lawsuit for us happened, and this really matters as other folks are thinking about this, because these problems, every a lot of folks on this Zoom, on this webinar, they're experiencing it in their communities right now, right? Yep, so the exactly. biggest value we can give is what were we doing to address the problem? I know you don't want to talk about that right no, now. No, no, no. I'm about. I'm about to. I'm about to go right there. To we're gonna we're gonna pivot to responses and solutions, California and broadly in just one second. Just to close the loop on on the the lawsuit, Amanda. When you hear those key findings from Joe's report. Um, why does that add up to a lawsuit? I mean, yeah, it's a bunch of um, crazy, terrible, wrong stuff. Why does that add up to a lawsuit? Does it only add up to a lawsuit in California or does it potentially add up to lawsuits in other places as well? I think it adds up to a lawsuit. I think it should add up to a lawsuit in, in every state across the country um, okay. because we know that California is not an outlier here in at least in the you know the the basic facts of this case which is that we know that across the country throughout the pandemic um students of color students from low-income families and and oftentimes students in in areas with with fewer educational services to begin with um were and and I don't really like the term you know experiencing learning loss right we're like we're actively harmed right by yeah. the failure of governments to ensure that they were able to access the classroom in a way that was, you know, equitable, if not equal, right, to, to their peers. And um, I think that California is unique in the sense that we do have this clause in our constitution that requires that all students, right, receive a basically equivalent education. So right. it's always surprising to folks that there's no federal right to an education, it seems so fundamental, um, and it is fundamental. Um, that being said, many states do have um, similar clauses, right, that require basic educational equity. And while that has yeah. historically been interpreted as, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, which I think is certainly the case here, I think what's unique about the lawsuit is that, you know, we also talk about the need for, you know, familial engagement, social, emotional learning, all of that, um, yeah. that, you know, as 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 Lakeisha mentioned, like that these groups are providing, yes, of course, core academic services, but also really crucially engaging with the community in ways that we don't always see, you know, schools and districts and states do. Um, so I guess what I would say is that I do absolutely think that there is a possibility for lawsuits following this model in other states. I think state constitutions are in general underutilized. Um, and I think that, you know, most state constitutions, even if they don't have an educational provision like we do, they absolutely have an equivalent to, you know, the equal protection clause um, right. and often interpret that much more generously than the federal government does. So we can talk about race discrimination here. We can talk about wealth discrimination. Um, and I think that all of that is fair game. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Amanda, can you summarize now as we close out on the lawsuit part, the suit settled recently. Um, it's a two billion dollar ish pot of money. Can you spell out for people what the settlement is and what that settlement means? Because that's our bridge to talking about what happens with this money and coming back to Lakeisha around um, uh, evidence based responses. 
Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that question. So the the settlement basically hinges on on two parts. The first is the passage of a law. Um, so, and we're anticipating this happening through the budgeting process, which is currently underway. Um, so the law itself will likely be finalized by June. Um, yeah. The passage of a law basically requiring that for essentially funds that are going to be used for the remaining three years of um, a pre-existing program, actually the Learning Emergency Recovery Block Grant Program, mm -hmm. um, that those funds be used in ways that we know are evidence-based and that we know are, are going to be effective, right, to help the students that were most, again, not left behind, but were most harmed by their lack of remote access to the classroom during the pandemic. Um, so that legislation is currently sort of working its way through the process. If it does not pass, right, because the settlement is contingent on the outcomes yeah. of this legislation, we have the right to reopen the case. It's our hope and expectation that that won't happen. Um, but that is, those are the next steps. And I would say that what is unique about the restrictions the settlement places um, on the $2 billion in funds. So another condition of the settlement is if there aren't $2 billion at least, right, left, to go towards these purposes, we can also yeah. reopen the case. So the restrictions we're placing on them is we're incorporating the federal evidence-based standard to mm -hmm. ensure that okay. you know school districts and schools um, are are really going with programs that we know have a, a demonstrated track record of success. Yeah. We incorporated language um, that community groups should be involved in that process because we know groups like the Oakland Reach and Community Coalition perform absolutely critical services that are sort of integral to public education and should be you know thought of in that way. Yeah. Um, and and then lastly, we expanded accountability um, through um, an expansion of standing, and this is a little bit technical to California, um, through the what's called the uniform complaint procedure. So whereas before um, our system put the onus on parents and students, typically again from like the least resource communities to challenge schools allocation of funds. Now any member of the public can, um, including organizations. Um, so for example, the gotcha. Open could challenge, Community yeah. Coalition could challenge. Um, and gotcha. I think all of that is going to mean that the dollars will get to where they need to go in a way that is much more transparent and much more directed than they were going to before. So Norma asked in, in the Q&A, Who's who's getting um, who's getting the money? The, this is money that already exists. It's about how the money that exists is going to be spent. And if I understand you right, correct me definitely if I'm wrong. It, it's sort of focus times two. One is focus on the students who have been harmed, and two, focus those resources. Focus those resources, not spend the money broadly focus those resources on the students that have been harmed, and secondly, focus on evidence-based um, practices that produce learning gains. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. And to speak more directly to the question, um, so there is a needs assessment component of this. And you know, we were very reluctant to create additional work for school districts. And so we were happy that um, you know, we we have the academics who worked on this case, and we have county leads who have already been sort of implementing programs across the state that are, are going to help schools um, and districts to the extent they need to conduct these needs assessments, um, which will identify, you know, the kids whose, um, and, you know, I know test results are an imperfect indicator, but, you know, whose test results have not reflected that they are at the level where they really should be, um, as well as, um, and I think this is really important, kids who are disengaged um, from the classroom, not through, you know, their own choice by any means, but just because really being excluded from the classroom was an alienating experience for um, for many families. And so using those two metrics, what we call chronic absenteeism and then um, academic performance as reflected in, again, imperfect test results. That's how we're trying to identify the kids. That's fantastic. Um, thanks so much. All right, let's, we're going to pivot around to uh, this combination of what, how best to use these resources, which also stands for um, really what's the response that will produce the kind of outcomes that we hope for instead of the outcomes that we've gotten to date. Um, Natalie, I'm going to come to you in just a minute because I know you've been part of a working group. But Lakeisha, I want to come back to you because we we started out, we were going to talk about Oakland Reach and then we got, kind of went down the lawsuit rabbit hole. But um, can you tell us just a, a little bit about Oakland Reach and the work that you all have been doing? 
Yeah, sure. But can I just say one thing? Yeah, of course. Um, okay. So I do want to, I do want to just close out the law. I do want to say something about the settlement piece, which okay. is there is a huge, and Amanda has set the stage for that very clearly that like groups like the Oakland reach and Coco played a large role in this. And I think for people who are thinking about this in their states, really being mindful of what it means to bring families into this, into something like this, it is a huge undertaking, right? Yes. Um, lots of depositions, lots of trying to refute or sort of destroy the validity of yeah. what we were doing. And I think what really, really helped us over the finish line, which we're now about to get into, right, is like what our organizations were already doing on the ground helped, I think, a lot. But I do want to share that this was an enormous um, capacity lift on the side of our organization as a parent-led group to be a part of this settlement. So I just wanted to share that. You know, that's that's just a really, that's a really good and important point. Um, litigation is, is tough and it is really hard. So here we have a group of people who you described um, under enormous pressure and also trying to respond in real time to, to meet the needs of kids and families. And this is an additional thing. And you, you, we could think it's brilliant and it's, um, it's fascinating and it's an interesting pressure point and it's really important and all those things. Yeah, except we're not actually the plaintiffs, right? We're not getting deposed. And so it's a really good reminder. Um, litigation can seem like a powerful tool um, but it's also, it's an intense undertaking with a lot of pressure involved. Amanda, I saw you came back on the screen. Did you want to add something to what Lakeisha just uh, said? Because I think that's a, such an important point. No, I, I guess I just came back on the screen to nod my head so that people could see me in solidarity because <laughs> like, I think that that's absolutely right. And, and, yeah. and it cannot be understated. And I mean, some of the questions that members of the Oakland Reach were subject to during depositions were just extraordinarily difficult, hostile, insulting, sometimes degrading, insulting, <laughs> exactly. yeah, right. degrading, yeah. insulting, right? So, uh, you know, the things that she, like questions about, you know, are you really a low income family? You know, are you, how are you spending your resources? You know, why can't you buy your kids? Like, is it, is it, isn't it your own fault? This, this sort of family blaming that we have seen historically um, yeah. and, and is still so present today. So I think that, I, the only reason that I came back on was just kind of to nod enthusiastically and to say that there is a cost to this. And so I don't I don't think that anyone should come away from this thinking that it is easy or that there isn't that it doesn't place a heavy burden on the plaintiffs, both the individuals and the organizations that serve them. Yeah. And Lakeisha, let's go around to another point that you made in our earlier conversation, which is around parent and accountability and where, um, in your view, the, the appropriate expenditure of energy and focus for parents is um, that you, the burden of accountability, which Joe talked about, that accountability is extremely important here, um, should not rest on, on parents. Um, can you talk to that a little bit? So quickly, you did ask me about what Oakland Reach was. I mean, we're going to we're gonna get to all of it. Okay, so I'll back up. <laughs> accountability. Yeah. is this, which I shared, is that accountability is key, right? But it's all hard. You got to pick your heart, right? Yeah. So I think for us, we really try to be an example of like the kind of hard you can pick that's going to get you closest to your kids being able to read and do math. We have a reading and math crisis in this country, right? Yeah. So the point I was trying to make is that some of the traditional ways in which we try to hold our local districts and state accountable, they don't necessarily get us to a place that's measurable to kids being able to read and do math better. Yeah. So for us, it's really about pick your hard to hold systems accountable to. Yeah. So I know when we get into our solution and what we've built, it yeah. is still accountability, but is a heart that we've chosen that allows us to have measurable impact. So you just got to choose your heart, right? Yeah, that's so well said. So well said. And look, we all have um, different capacities for hard, but nobody's got endless capacities for hard. Mm -hmm. So you got to pick your spots, right? Exactly. 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 So I want to hear about Oakland Reach. 
and some of the things that you're doing. I'm going to hear, we want to hear from Darren about what they're doing in, uh, in Compton. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Natalie about how, um, how Education and Trust West is engaging in some of this planning about what should happen with the $2 million, because $2 billion, my bad. Um, what happens with those $2 billion can really set sort of a, a standard and a mark for, uh, for people around the country about effective response to what has happened over the past few years and what has happened over, you know, forever years, right? So, um, Lakeisha, now we're going to go back to... Tell us <laughs> we're having little... fun here, John, you and I. <laughs> we are. Tell us it's a little bit. It's for your bit. birthday. Well, gotta, you know, you're, you're sitting there in front of the Golden birthday. Gate Bridge or a version of the Golden Gate Bridge, and you're making me happy because that's my home. And so um, take it away. Tell us a little about Oakland Reach and um, what you have been doing, what you did through the pandemic, and where you are right now. So let me see how quickly and succinctly I can do this. So Oakland Reach, right? Parent-led Black and Brown families. Most of our families come born and raised in Oakland and were failed in Oakland schools and are doing everything they can to disrupt this cycle of intergenerational yep. poverty. Prior to the pandemic, we were policy and advocacy focused, more traditional advocacy yep. and policy, and we had success. We had two one-of-a-kind policy wins. One was the opportunity ticket. You can check that out on our website. And then the second one was our literacy for all work, which was really driven around what does that look like for our policies around literacy to focus on uplifting the whole family around literacy and not just looking at early literacy, right? And we got an MOU with the district to move to the science of reading, pandemic hit, and then our whole organization changed. And that's when we built the virtual hub. The virtual hub, which I think is still on our website too, was really us building our own community um, where our kids were receiving academic supports, families were receiving um, economic, educational, and social resources. And the biggest deal about that was not the inputs of the hub, it's what the hub did. In the first six weeks um, or first five weeks of the hub, 60% of our K through two students went up two or more reading levels on the district's assessment and 30% went up um, three or more. Wow. So, and we did all of this with paraprofessionals, tutors um, from the district and charter schools. So that led us to a question of, wait a minute, in a country where we have teacher shortages, where those teacher shortages hit our communities and our schools the most, what does it look like for us to build a model that actually leverages folks from our community to help close that achievement gap? And that's how we got to the model we're at now, which is the liberator model, which upskills parents and caregivers from the community to become paid, district paid employee. Um, I think that's so important to note, yep. <laughs> literacy and math tutors, right? You bet. Um, and so that is, um, you know, the nutshell of our work. I think I did that in a minute and a half. You did that fantastically. Joanna says, amazing. I agree. Um, so it, it's also, it's a fascinating, and this is where I want to bring Darren in, a fascinating example of a um, community organization partnership with a, um, with a district to really meet the needs of kids. Um, Darren, I apologize that we went a little long on that side of the uh, of the the lawsuit, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm really glad to bring you into this conversation. Um, you are the the superintendent in Compton, and you've been this for more than a dozen years. Like, how many superintendents are there in America who've had the same job for a dozen years? Um, you have you have to be the longest serving, most spectacular superintendent around. Well, 15 years now as a superintendent, uh, 12 oh years God. here. Wow. But uh, quite, quite some time. Quite some time. Tell us, uh, uh, locate us a little bit about some of the demographics of Compton, and then I want to get into what you've done to um, boost achievement in Compton and particularly ba uh, bouncing off of what Lakeisha was talking about your partnerships with community organizations to do that? So yes, uh, Compton Unified School District uh, consists of about 17,000 students. We have okay. a 88% 80, uh, Latino population, about 12% uh, Black population. Uh, roughly 
43% English language learners and about 16% of our students are special needs. Wow. Okay. Wow. Um, so you've had a, you've had a very good run, very impressive. Um, tell the audience a little bit about where you have focused and how you've, how you've uh, done that. Yeah, so when I first arrived uh, 12 years ago, our graduation rates were at 58%, not very well. Our uh, wow. assessment scores were not uh, spectacular. Our dropout rates were in the uh, mid 20%. Uh, since okay. then, we have graduation rates of, of 90% throughout the district. Our assessment scores have, have done very well. We've completely rebounded uh, from the SBAC scores uh, with the 6% gain in math most recent year, uh, which is higher than where we were prior to the pandemic. So uh, lots of things that are going on. Um, we have an intense focus on, on really developing SMART goals to drive what we do within the organization. I was mm -hmm. trained in Malcolm Baldrige Performance Excellence Standards. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, we've implemented that throughout the organization. Uh, we began in the summer by having our site leaders develop SMART goals that they're going to focus on based upon the most recent results. And then throughout the year, we reflect upon those SMART goals with data chats with the superintendent. And we have those uh, data chats monthly to determine how we're performing against the state indicators. And so that is an ongoing process where we adjust. We also uh, benchmark our performance against our surrounding competitors. I won't say districts because they are competitors. Yeah. And uh, you know when we first started this process, um, they were all kicking our tails, uh, not so much anymore. So, you know, we're proud to put our dashboard indicator against any of the surrounding school districts uh, within our area. And we're, we're on a, a, a very great trajectory. I love that. I um, plan to achieve much more. You, you talked about the process part, the SMART goals. Talk a little about where um, you have put your district's energy in, in, in substantively in terms of creating the conditions in which uh, young people who may be coming up with a, a variety of challenges, right, are yes. still, you've created, you're creating the conditions for them to have real learning opportunities. Well, I, I would like to, you know, chunk them into different areas. So okay. we, we have an intense focus on mentoring and college readiness with various partnerships. We also have an uh, emphasis on sports and athletics, uh, arts and enrichment, an intense focus on, on STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, yeah. arts, and math, with our goal of eliminating the opportunity gap for black and brown children. Yep. Uh, we have an intense focus on health and wellness, and perhaps the, the, the dive right now might be in the health and wellness uh, component mm -hmm. within our organization. Interestingly enough, we were sued by public counsel back, All right. in, back in 2013 or so. And, and based upon that, um, we, we put in place uh, mental health wellness centers within three of our campuses at that time mm -hmm. to address some of the issues that were alleged in the lawsuit, mm -hmm. which were never founded, but alleged in the lawsuit. <laughs> so we, we, we put in place uh, three mental health wellness centers at, at our school sites. That three grew to nine, grew to 11, eventually 21, and now at uh, 30. 30 uh, wellness centers at our school sites focused on SEL, bringing in community-based organizations to provide the services that our students need around mental health and other, other services. We also uh, have a just a, a rich process in place where we begin with uh, mental health screening uh, through the use of Panorama. And from that mental health screening, we then farm out services that students are in need of through an agency known as CareSolus. We also have yeah. a second step curriculum in place at our elementary school sites and then move this world uh, uh, SEL curriculum in place at our secondary schools. So Darren, um, a lot of the emphasis in the settlement of this lawsuit is not only on who, which young people these resources should be focused on, but how those resources should, should be focused. And, and the term evidence-based 
get rightly gets used all the time. I'm I'm really curious, and this has been a big theme for the campaign right now. Uh, and somebody else mentioned, uh, maybe it was Joe mentioned implementation. You know, it's easy enough to name the things that are good things to do to help students. It's really, really hard to do them really, really well. Um, which is what's necessary for young people who are struggling and facing complicated circumstances. So I'm, I'm really curious how you as a superintendent think about evidence-based and what, what um, efforts are going to be most efficacious. Well, I'd like to back up a little because you, know, you, you took a long time uh, with everyone else on, the, on this issue of a lawsuit, but Compton was an intervening party. Mm -hmm. we, we eventually had to pull out be, to expedite the case, but uh, Compton was an intervening party in the lawsuit, yep. Yep. and we provided quite a bit of uh, data to public counsel to make the case on this issue. Uh, we looked at the uh, assessment scores 2018 of all yep. the school districts in the state of California, and then we <laughs> compared those afterwards um, in terms of the impact on student achievement. And we also looked at the dashboard indicators, uh, how, how students were doing within Compton and then how they were doing after the pandemic to provide all that data to public yeah. counsel to make their case. But in, in terms of evidence-based practices, um, it's very easy to implement. Um, school districts use a resource known as the PREM manual, pre-referral intervention manual, uh, to assess what the issues are with student learning and then to provide the recommended uh, solutions to address those issues around, you know, anything. It could yep. be, you know, it could be behavioral issues, but oftentimes academic issues. All of that is incorporated in there. So there's plenty of evidence-based practices that can be implemented. But tutoring, you know, in-class tutoring, very well-proven uh, yep. practice that actually makes a difference. The problem is that we oftentimes don't do it in class. We do, because we know that that's the time that we have, I, I hate to use the word control of the kids, but you have them. Yeah. Whereas you can't necessarily determine that they're going to be there on the weekend. Right. So the, the use of, of, of things like that uh, to produce better results and outcomes, uh, as well as uh, community-based organizations that can come in and provide the SEL, unnecessary for students, as well as the additional supports in the classroom. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Darren. And um, we'll be back to you shortly. Natalie, I apologize it's taken so long to get to you, but it's really nice to see you. And thanks. I bet you have a lot of thoughts banging around in your head. Um, you you um, have entered this um, space now as part of a working group working on, okay, um, what should happen to the $2 billion? And it's some of this conversation we were just having with Lakeisha and with Darren about, okay, what's the most effective, what are the most ineffective interventions? How do you involve community organizations? Tell us a little bit about what you're thinking on this front. Yep, thank you so much to the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, to you, John and Mary, for inviting me to participate. Yeah, I've had a lot of thoughts come up as I've uh, listened to um, the great insights from folks on this webinar. And I think that what rises to the top for me is, and as I engage in how the um, settlement is being implemented um, in the state, is that A, these things have, these gaps have already existed. These are yep. issues, as Joe was going through his findings, each and every finding, we could have said the same thing before the pandemic began. Um, and B, uh, to Lakeisha's point, we know where the solutions lie. Great work is happening that Oakland Reach is doing, that uh, Darren is doing in Compton Unified. We know what the solutions are. I think that the big stumbling block for us in California is a the support that district leaders, school leaders have to implement these solutions and the guidance that they're being provided from the state to mm -hmm. move mm -hmm. these things forward, these transformative mm -hmm. practices forward. Mm -hmm. And B, there just needs to be an overarching mindset shift about the ability for marginalized students, particularly black students to just succeed. 
um, academically. I think that what underlies all of this, and I think what, what came up very explicitly to what Alakisha and Amanda were mentioning in the depositions that they were doing, yeah. is that there's an underlying assumption that these issues of disparities are the fault of harmed communities. Yeah. And I think that we need a reorientation to uh, focus on how are our systems harming students? How are we perpetuating that harm? Or how are we trying to um, interrupt and counteract that harm? Mm -hmm. And how are, can we leverage things like this settlement, things like the local control funding formula that dictates how, how funding is allocated and how districts are held accountable? How do we leverage those policies with an orientation towards uh, you know, reducing harm to students. Mm -hmm. And I think to the conversation around implementation, yeah. we have, we know how to do it. We know what works. And it's just a matter of a commitment to making it work and providing the supports that education leaders need across the state to making it work with an orientation toward um, believing that students can achieve and setting high expectations met with the supports that are needed. So those are the things that I'm, I'm taking away from Fantastic. my participation and, and the conversation. Um, going to the working group that you're part of, um, to, uh, thinking about these, these resources that will now be focused um, in, in population and in, in action, um, what are you recommending? What are you pushing here, and what are you hearing, and and how do you how do you see this unfolding? I think in the short term, <laughs> the types of things we would want to recommend is some clear guidance and responsibilities that county offices will have, that the state will have in supporting mm -hmm. uh, districts in implementing the needs assessments required by the settlement, identifying evidence based practices providing the capacity building and coaching necessary to be able to build strong connections with families and with community-based organizations who can then actually take on and contract with districts to implement practices they know already work because of their mm -hmm. deep knowledge of communities that need to be served. So those are the things that we're going to Great. be watching as these things are implemented. Lakeisha, can you can you bring back yourself in the Golden Gate Bridge, please? Thank you. Um, you are on the the forefront of exactly what Natalie was just talking about. Um, as you said, you were on this before, um, and I think it would be fantastic. And and uh, you know, you, you can hear me cheering when you talk about. Look, we have a crisis in reading and math, and we have to get about doing it. And of course, your particular response a human capital response given my background of working with citizens i mean this is like wow it's fantastic and i know you have a video uh, about the liberator uh, model can you talk for a second about what you've been doing because i think people are going to find it so fascinating and then that video is enormously powerful yes yeah, so coming out of the pandemic um i know i told i shared that in the pandemic we had the hub Yep. And then we never get too far ahead of our families, right? So when our families started going back to school, we had to think about innovation and evolving this virtual model that was doing so great into something um, that could follow our families back into schools. And that's when we extracted the secret sauce from the hub, which was this um, paraprofessional um, literacy supports. Um, yep. And again, I said, we put that question in front of us, was that what, what would it look like? if we could train more folks from our communities to step into these academic leadership roles, take them off the sideline and really put them in the game, right? Yep. And that's where the liberator model came from. And this model again is, and our team right as we speak are like, I think they this morning they were out at schools recruiting families at our lowest performing schools. We still grassroots go out to schools in the mornings and the afternoons. So we recruit families from our lowest performing schools in Oakland to become literacy and math tutors. Um, these are the same families who say, my kid is struggling with reading. I struggled with reading, right? They are looking for solutions. And these are hard things to tackle, but that's why I said oh earlier, God. choose your heart, right? Yeah, exactly. The heart that we have chosen, 
right? And the thing that gives me so much energy when I wake up in the morning is that we are doing something we can measure, right? And I think, um, I don't know if um, Mary noted this yet, but we also have like SERPI's research report, um, evidence showing that like our tutors are as effective in t as teachers as helping to close the gap. And I think what's important about that is that it's not a knock on teachers. It's actually a big plus in a country where we have a teacher shortage yeah, to be bad. able to say that without getting your BA or a teaching credential, which is a big lift for someone who may be at home. I was a single mom with three kids. I got two, one in college, one going to college. This is no joke, right? Yeah. So to just think that the pipeline is turning folks from our communities into BA credential teachers is so cute, right? But it's not reality. So we yeah. are building a reality of like, you can, you still have to learn and you still have to grow, but we're taking your SEL, your commitment, um, and we're building on top of that, right? Um, and putting you in the game and building you there and look at the results that they're getting with kids. So we really see this as a whole new talent pipeline. Um, and it gives our families real power so that they really are not just affecting the academic outcomes of their kids, but other folks' kids. And like I said, I can say it's, it, but the video says it 20 times better than I can let, say it. Let's, let's see the video. Okay. Sierra, can you, uh, can you roll tape? Here we go. Hurry up, baby. Rinse your face. The pandemic truly affected our children because I know that a lot of our students are below reading level. And I believe that's greatly in part to the fact that we were doing long distance learning for about two years. Many of the people in our communities are low income and have difficulty accessing technology or they couldn't afford to stop working to be able to support their child, to log them in into their classes online, to be able to switch them from different Zoom rooms to different Zoom rooms. This puts some of our children behind in their reading level and education. It's personal to me because my daughter had to go through the process of long distance learning, so I completely relate to all the challenges that parents had. I was inquiring about like extra work that I could do, and this individual was like, hey, you know, I know about a program that's launching. It's through a place called Oakland Reach. She said, I think you'd be great for that. A literacy liberator is someone who is passionate about teaching the younger generation to read and love to read. I was given the whole system for SIPS, how to operate it step for step. I learned about the reading ladder. I was given a lesson on dyslexia and how to work with children with dyslexia. Good morning. Oh my God, the children, I love all of my students, they love me back. You can feel it when they come and spend time with me, like 30 minutes, 35 minutes is never enough. So now that we learned our new sounds, let's go over the sounds that we already know, okay? Moms, aunties, grandparents, people within our own community as a whole make the best tutors because we connect directly with the children. Down. Down. I think it's comforting the people who are teaching you are people that are just like you are local people who you see all the time family members our liberators really work with kids all over campus and in multiple different classrooms and they are gathering those small groups of kids and giving them just that that targeted boost that's going to help them access everything else in their school day I see Susie all over our campus, right? Picking up kids, bringing them to her classroom, doing these really, really targeted lessons and then kind of releasing them back into their classes to be much more successful. Susie's impact on our students is incredible. Those students are achieving differently in their classrooms. And you know, when you see kids that are doing better in their classrooms, you see it in their faces, you see it in how they play at recess. 
for me, just believing in the children and making them believe in themselves is like probably one of the most important things for me. I think the academic conversation of the classroom just uh, improves and improves and all the kids get pushed farther along when our struggling students are supported. I think for me and my daughter, it's allowed us to grow closer. I like waking up every day in the morning and knowing that in all of my students' lives. This job has a mission <laughs> and I challenge accept it. <laughs>
Um, Natalie, I want to come. Thank you, Darren. I want to come to you in a second about a, the policy enabling um, environment for just what Lakeisha is doing and what Darren's talking about. Well, let's let's do that right now. Um, talk about what what policy. You know, Darren said, ah, pish posh about policy. Let's don't spend a lot of time talking about policy. Let's just do the work, which, of course, I agree with. But I also know that policy creates the context in which um, great operators like Darren do their work. So how do you think about creating the kinds of policies that create the right environment for people like Darren to operate? Sure, I think that some of the policy solutions that we might be able to see, and to Darren's point, it's about being focused on implementing these things and having impact. So we can set policies, but it really takes leadership and a vision from state leaders to influence and to set an expectation of districts because not all districts have leaders like Darren or not all districts have organizations like Oakland Reach. Um, to partner with, right? Yeah. So it, it means that the state needs to set the expectation that we are going to have a laser focus on implementing racial justice through our education system, and they need to provide the supports that are necessary to do that. And so I talked about supports a little bit before, but what I, I believe that means is that we need to put more money into the policy framework I have. Sorry, there's a a siren going off. <laughs> no worries. We can't hear. We can't hear. Oh, great. Good. Um, it means putting money into having a more robust system by which we support district leaders, county offices of ed to make the types of improvements and implement the types of programs we know work. And it also means requiring districts to identify the right programs that are going to work for the right groups of students. Like Darren mentioned, you have to find what's going to work for Latinx students, what's going to work for Black students, what's going to work for students with disabilities, and target those supports to those groups of students in a very intentional way. And the state needs to take a leadership role in setting that as an expectation. So, Joe... Thank you, Natalie. Over your head, it says you're at the Center for the Transformation of Schools. And here we go. We got people talking about new ways of organizing um, people power, new ways of engaging communities, new ways of working with organizations, and talking about creating the policy environment that makes all of that um, not only acceptable, but actually the norm. So tell me how you think about when, put aside the lawsuit for a second, you think about the transformation of schools, that's what I'm hearing here, some of that. I'm curious for your reaction. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think we haven't talked a whole lot about teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, what's going to change, at least within school settings, the patterns we've seen are incredible educators, right? And they're incredible educators who stepped up during the pandemic to do everything under the sun to help young people. I think a, the, a cabinet of teacher leaders and school counselors and community groups um, and parents who are already in schools is really how we're gonna move forward. It's not gonna be the states, there's gonna be mandates. We still need a federal right to education, but it's gonna be talented, exceptional, committed folks working with fellow teachers and peers and thinking about how can we make learning as engaging as possible. We're not gonna learn and accelerate our way out of this. We're not gonna, um, we need evidence-based practices and interventions, but when you boil that down, it's a question of are young people excited to go to school? Are they excited to learn? Are they excited to to be in this space? And I think we have to start from that, from that approach before and think about, you know, that that top that top down support for bottom up change that has been said kind of over and over again in different ways. But we have to think about new ways of adopting policy, of adopting standards, and new ways of working together. And um right now there is no formal way. We have the Healthy Kids Survey, 
Um, we have the school staffing survey, but there's very little formal ways to get feedback from local teachers, families, um, and, and community members on the state of education. So we, we need that feedback loop and new ways of, of doing policy in order for us to, to, to have a, a new path forward. And a lot of that, honestly, John starts with um, asking people, asking questions, which yeah. is something we tend to skip ahead from. We say, oh, we're going to look at the statewide data. And now here's these 10 options you have for evidence-based practices. Good luck. We'll see you in two years. Goodbye, yeah. you know, Superintendent Brawley. So I, I think we need to just change the way we, we think about policy and who's it for. Um, Lakeisha, it's something that Joe just said really makes me want to come back to you. Um, you talked very powerfully about parents should not hold responsibility for accountability. Um, and at the same time, I want to ask you, I know that you're so laser focused on results, on outcomes, on progress. So what's that feedback loop that you're using that lets parents, community members uh, know what's happening, what progress is being made, what more needs to be done? How do we do that feedback loop without putting, um, you know, giving, giving parents and community members the right information, uh, but not making them responsible for accountability? How do you think about that? That was a that was an interesting set of questions. Let me see how I can best answer that. Good. So Go. let me let me break it down real quick. So let me say something directly because that that statement had a context, right? So with the settlement, because this is really key, there's this piece about and Amanda brought it up about like they can reopen things if we find that the state's not doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And what I've said is that to ask parents to try to figure out that that's not happening is like a fool's game. Right. That's so silly. I'm just yes. naming. Right. So that was part of the accountability piece, right? It's just gotcha. like, please don't ask our parents to hold districts accountable for something that they have no context around and right. haven't been given. Like that that was that piece. The second piece that you I want to get the second part you asked about. I'm, um, I'm curious the about feedback the, loop. The feedback, the feedback loop. loop. Exactly. Exactly. So um let me give you a really specific example um about what, how we, we believe in feedback, but if you want to get from feedback to action, have a solution on the other side of it, right? So we can create spaces all day long around feedback, right? I don't think folks are listening. Okay. I think there becomes a desensit like yeah. folks are desensitized sure. to feedback. Sure. So let me give you an example about a way in which we use feedback, apply it to your context. So with our liberator model, remember we're recruiting parents and caregivers when they are selected, they join our fellowship. We train them, they get pedagogical supports, they get a stipend, we reimburse all of their live scans and fingerprinting, yep. and then we have to release them, okay? Then we, our relationship changes from one where we're sort of controlling their experience to one when we're, there, we're influencing their experience. And this is where data becomes really important. So 45 days into our liberators being at their different sites, and they're across 50 plus elementary and middle schools in the district, yep. Yep. we start to ask a very set of targeted questions around the conditions that they are in, yep. right? How have they been onboarded? Who's coaching them? Like what's happening? We then synthesize that feedback and then we use that feedback to have a very targeted discussion with the district's central team, right, around what's happening. This may sound boring, okay, but no. when you want to get to measurable impact, right, no. you've got to be able to get feedback that you can be actionable with. Right. So that feedback loop that we use with the liberators allows conditions to shift in the godly work that they're doing much quicker than if I just bring you in the room and get all the feedback in the world about kids not being able to read and do math. Right. Yep. So yep. it's how are we taking that funnel and narrowing it down to a place where feedback can be actionable? Because I know Darren could attest to this as being a, a superintendent for 13 years. What haven't you heard about what's working? <laughs> or what's not working? Like, you know, yeah. like what haven't you heard? Right. Mm -hmm. But what would be more beneficial to people on the district side is when they are able to get actionable feedback on how to shift conditions, 
to get to better results, right? Obviously totally. in trusted partnerships. Totally. So I'm just telling you that we're leveraging the feedback of our parents because they're liberators that. in the schools, I but to that. actionable yeah. condition shifts, right? Yep. So you called out Darren. Darren, come back for a sec, please. Um, I'm curious about how you think about feedback, what you're sharing with with families um, that you find useful, that doesn't doesn't burden them, um, but really helps accelerate the learning. What are you What are you doing in terms of feedback? You know, we we share everything that is available, mm -hmm. and we have a a very robust mailer system where we actually develop a map, for lack of better words, a, a, a brief pamphlet magazine like where we send out information in terms of everything that's going on in the district, what are the opportunities, uh, what's available. Um, when, when you talk about this context of what we're speaking about right now, yep. then this is something that has to be incorporated into your LCAP process, your local control accountability process, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to bring in all the interested parties, your district black, black advisory committee, your, your DLAC committee, your district English language learners committee, your special education committee, all of them are providing input. Your teachers are providing input. Members of the community are providing input. So a lot of information is shared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a misnomer to think that districts don't share information. Most do. But in terms of the individuals that participate, the participation rate is low. But we do our best to send the information out. We do our best in form. And we, we, we certainly incorporate the feedback that we receive back from those various entities into our local control accountability plan. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I, the poll just went up, so I hope people will fill that out. It's it's really helpful to us to get this feedback. Um, this has been terrific, uh, it's just so interesting. Um, and I think our audience has found it fantastic. I just wanna do a quick, um, a quick go round of um, final thoughts. 30 seconds a piece, um, what you're taking away from this conversation or what you want people across the country to take away from this conversation. Uh, Joe, let's start with you, come to Darren, then Natalie, then Amanda and Lakeisha to close us. Um, somebody asked me if, if lawsuits have become the kind of de facto form of accountability in public mm -hmm. education this week. Yeah. Um, no. And, and, I, and I hope they don't have to be. Um, but I hope this does inspire you that it requires a lot of people, a lot of a lot of stakeholders and frankly money to shift the terrain and shift the landscape. So I hope you're not overwhelmed and you're more inspired of what's possible. And this is just the beginning. Fantastic. Natalie, thought, takeaway? I think one major takeaway is that we know what needs to be done. We know there's a huge problem. We all see it. And it's about the will of our local and state leaders to take this issue on and not be uh, satisfied with just maintaining the status quo, but really making significant changes and leveraging the expertise of our communities to make that change. Awesome. Amanda, final thought. Sure. Um... I, I want to echo Joe and just say that, um, you know, as 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 much hubris as lawyers often have, I, I just want to mm -hmm. emphasize that, you know, lawyering is a tool and we think of it as one tool to shift the conversation from one that is, you know, solely about policy to one that is about rights. And in order to do that, we need to follow the lead of the, the districts and the groups and, um, you know, the Oakland reach is, Lakeisha always says, I love how much you love us because we really do. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the groups that are, that are doing the work and to sort of build collective power in that way to use the law and to use the legal system, which is so often a form um, a forum for repression um, to to elevate those voices and to, to do so in a way that is not just, you know, honorary or representative, but that but that is tethered to rights and is tethered to outcomes. And so I think law is an exciting place to do that, but again, not the only way and, and certainly should not be the primary way. Darren, you're doing it a different way. Um, final thoughts as a as a district leader. Thank you, Amanda. Um, uh, for, for me, yeah, I, the, the devil's in the details and, mm -hmm. and whether or not this is eventually funded, that's in the details as well. But in, in order to make a 
an, an impactful change. We, we simply have to do school differently. And, and as I said before, the, the days of closing your door, doing it all by yourself, those days are gone. It, it takes the, the power of everyone within that community to uplift that community and to increase the student achievement outcomes and what's possible for the students that we serve within California. Love that, amen. Lakeisha, bring us home. Families are not just folks you engage with, they are experts too, building solutions that are changing outcomes for our communities. Like Natalie said, we know it's working. How do we scale it? How do we expand it? How do we focus? I know that this is a big, ugly problem, yeah. um, but we need to be like surgeons and methodical about the way that we kill this cancer. And part of it is not throwing every single treatment towards it. Um, so come check out our treatment, right? <laughs> Coming straight from our communities, oaklandreach.org. Um, and I'm just excited that people wanted to come and learn from all of us today because wow. that's the beginning. I totally agree. And I just wanted, uh, on behalf of the campaign, thank all of you for joining. Um, this was a thrilling conversation and so many different fantastic perspectives. Darren, Lakeisha, Amanda, Joe had to click off. And Natalie, thanks so much. Um, we're going to put up a screen with our upcoming, uh, our coming attractions, uh, and we will also send out a link with a uh, a link to this session as well. So thanks to everybody, and have a good day.